yes, we want to live here and want to build a, a, a life here. And we acknowledge that there's more opportunity here. But for a lot of people, the um, goal of getting a green card is so that they can return home, um, which is a little, um, it's a little odd because it, you're getting a permanent residence card, yeah. but you're getting it with the goal of going back home finally. Yeah. So you, you live your entire life here thinking like one day I'm gonna have a green card and go home. Welcome to So Where Are You From? I am your host, Nishin Bagheri, a first-generation Iranian-American by identity and an immigration attorney by profession. Today's guest is a fellow immigration attorney, Ms. Lizette Gomez. Lizette is a solo practitioner at her own firm called Gomez Law Firm. Welcome, Lizette. Thank you for taking the time from your busy work schedule to come speak with us today. Thank you for inviting me. So, Lizette, as I have to ask everybody, all my guests, so where are you from? So, I was born in Colombia. And um, I am Colombian by nationality and by identity, but I'm also very much an ATLian. <laughs> Definitely grew up here. I came to the States when I was seven and I've been in Atlanta the entire time. Okay, wonderful. So I call myself a Colombian ATLian. <laughs> I like that, Colombian ATLian. <laughs> that's, that's a different one. I like that one. <laughs> um, can you tell us, so you came at such a young age. Can you mm -hmm. tell us more about how you came from Colombia to the U.S.? Sure. So I came over in 1992. And I think anyone who has watched Narcos has <laughs> some context of what Colombia looked like yeah. um, in that era. Wow. Um, I came over in 1992, and I believe that um, Escobar was killed about a year later. Okay. So it was an era where um, there was just a ton of insecurity in Bogota. I lived in the capital. Um, a lot of car bombs going off randomly. Um, wow. Obviously, due to the violence and instability, there was a lot of economic instability. My parents um, really just couldn't make ends meet anymore. Yeah. Um, and I had family that was here already. Okay. My dad had brothers and sisters who had moved here years before us and had been asking him to come, come over. So um, he chose to come over first. It was his plan to come over, work. Mm -hmm. um, gain some economic stability and then go back. Just get, kind of get settled before bringing the family. Well, he, he, was, he, he didn't intend to bring us. Okay. He intended to come, he intended to work, earn money so that we could become economically stable okay. in Colombia um, and then go back. Okay. And once he got here, he realized, oh my God, there's not car bombs going off in the middle of the street. Yeah. You know, you wow. can walk outside. Um, it, there's safety, there's yeah. opportunity. And um, so six months later, he called my mom and he said, pack up the girls and come down. Um, so that's how, that was sort of the context of how we got here. The mechanics, um, the legal mechanics of how we got here is um, they requested a visitor's visa. Mm -hmm. um, we were lucky in that because we had family in the U.S., we had um, some financial backing Okay. in that sense. Um, because so, it is with tourist visas, like this is how it implicates into our immigration practice. Absolutely. Yes, that you have to show that, you know, you're going to be supportive when coming here so you become a burden on the government. Correct. And you have to show that you have the financial means and motivation to return to your country. Exactly. That you are, in fact, coming to visit. Temporarily. Right. And that you plan on returning. Yes. Um, so my dad's family helped us out a lot in, in being able to show that, prove that, and get that visitor's visa. Um, and were and, they giving visitor visas kind of easily to Colombians in general? Um, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> uh, yes, before that, I mean, Pablo Escobar had a visitor's visa. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but no, in that, by that time, the U.S. had caught on. And so it was getting harder and harder. Okay. So you did have a lot to prove. You did have a lot to show. Um, and security, uh, getting past security in the airport was becoming more and more and more difficult oh, at that time. Wow. Um, so, yeah, there was a time where it was very easy to get a visitor's mm -hmm. card, uh, visa. Pablo had one. Um, but, but, um, but it was getting more and more difficult because of that same for those for same, same reasons. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's um, so interesting. Yeah. So we got, we, we were able to come over on a visitor's visa and, um, and then just overstayed. Okay. So you overstayed. So, but you're, 
when you come as a tourist, you, there's, you don't get legal um, residency in that right. sense. So when you overstayed, how was that? Did things become more difficult because you didn't, then what, you're out of status? Yes. So we had about six months of status, mm -hmm. of legal status under the visitor's visa. Um, I, I will always say that we had a lot of angels in our paths oh. when we first came over. The fact that my dad's family gave him the financial backing to get the visitor's visa, the yeah. fact that they took us in, yeah. um, all of that. One of my uncles, one of my dad's brothers, my uncles, was married to a woman at that time who um, really made it a mission to bring people over. Oh, wow. Um, Where that was, was her background? Colombian also. Well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was just, um, I think it was her life's work, you wow. know? Um, she didn't do it professionally. She didn't, she wasn't um, involved with any nonprofits. She just did it on her own and she brought a ton of people over. It was fantastic and great. And so because that was her life's mission, um, she was able to guide my mother through what absolutely needed to be done right away. Once she arrived here Once in the US. Once we arrived here okay. on the US. So we had six months of, of um, legal status. And during those six months, um, this woman took my mom to the Social Security office, got us a Social Security card because we were still within status to get one, mm -hmm. um, got my parents' uh, driver's licenses. And got back then, it was easier to get driver's licenses than now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, we, we because we were able to get the social security card, we were yeah. able to get they were okay. able to get driver's licenses, um, and because we were still in status when they got it, mm -hmm. um, they got bank accounts. So basically, everything that we think of about documentation that is difficult for undocumented people to come, she got us that within those first six months. Wow! While we were in status, and um, that made our lives so much easier yeah. than a lot of people who come out of status, who come without visas, or who come with visas and don't have someone to guide them and fall out of status and then are not able to get those things later wow. on. Um, yeah, so was it much more difficult? Absolutely. I didn't know, I mean, I was seven years old, right? Yeah, so what was in your head? Did you think you're just going on vacation and just having, or did you know that you had to say a final goodbye to everyone back home? Girl. Um, I don't think that even my parents understood really what it meant uh -huh. to move to the U.S. and stay, un, you know, unauthorized. Okay. Um, but we had an idea that we were moving to the U.S. to live. They they did so, let you guys know. Yes. Because usually children have no say. They're like, just pack up. You're coming. Right. Quiet. No, they did let <laughs> us know. Um, by us, I mean, I, they they let me know. I was seven. My baby sister was two. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, true. You're we almost. didn't consult with her at all. <laughs> uh, but but I don't think, so we got a chance to say goodbye. And, you know, we got to have like a last family meal with everybody oh. and, and whatnot. But was there really an understanding? I think back now, one of those images that are ingrained in my head is my grandfather dropping us off at the airport. Um, and you go through this like glass door. Yeah where you go past security and everyone who back and you look back. Yeah. And I had no idea at the time that was the last time I was ever going to see my grandfather alive again. Wow. Um, during the time that we were here and we were undocumented, he passed away. He got sick. He got, he had cancer, oh. was sick for a very long time. Um, he passed away. And during none of those were we able to go visit him. Yeah. Because if you went back, you him. can't come back to the U.S. Correct. Yeah. So we weren't able to be there at the funeral. We weren't able to be there through his illness. We weren't able to be there at all. Yeah. Um, so you, you know you're coming to live, but you don't know what that entails. Yeah. What that means. Um, my cousin, and also I was seven. Yeah. You know, um, I, my idea of what the United States was was entirely from cartoons, TV, right? So I knew Baywatch <laughs> and Disney World. That's it. That's all oh. I knew. I was like, "There's gonna be blonde people on the beach, and there's gonna be Mickey Mouse." Yeah. Um, my cousin, who was a year older than me, who was my older brother, um, for all intents and purposes, he um, did everything he could. He set me down. He said, "We're gonna have English classes." He was already here. No, he was oh. there. So he, okay. he, because he was a year up above me, yeah. he had already started English class. Yeah. Um, so he sent me to, he's like, we're going to have English classes. I'm wow. going to teach you everything I know, which was hello, goodbye, and one, two, three. Yeah. But he equipped me with what he had yeah. <laughs> to Aww. equip me, right? He's eight, I'm seven. And he's like, let me give you the tools. Hello, goodbye, one, two, three. Aww. That was my English class. <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> Bless his heart. So, so we all knew. We all had this understanding that as a family we were going, we were going to leave some family behind. We were going to come. And um, what, Can I ask what the family, so was it more your mom's side of the family that was kind of left yes. behind? How did that, how did they, they feel about that or their? Um, I think everybody knew. Or your knew. mom felt. How did your mom feel? Oh, my God. Um, great questions to ask her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we were very close with my mom's side of the family. With my dad's side of the family, half of them were already here yeah. and half of them were there. So there was a, a disconnect through distance yeah. um, with them. But with my mom's side of the family, I mean, these were the people that I saw every day. They yeah. picked me up from school. We had lunch with, with them. We had dinner with them. Um, so that was very difficult yeah. because just like my mother and my dad raised me, my grandparents on her side also raised me. Yeah. Um, my, my cousin was my brother. Yeah. Um, so leaving them was difficult. Um, but, did it, but they probably understood yeah, I think yeah. everybody in the family had an understanding that we were going for a better life. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't make the, the distance it's, any easier. It doesn't make it easier. It yeah. just makes it more supportive and more encouraged. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So I can't imagine. Okay, so you're young. Your, your mom's coming. She's trying to figure it out herself. Right. Yeah, let alone with two, the stress of kids. Cause mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine that. It's like, you know, if I were to bring my even teenage kids somewhere new and I'm yeah. trying to worry, you, you're trying to get them as simulated as possible. Mm -hmm. um, how was that simulation like when you, when you started going to school, like with the language, with the English? and? Oh, man. Um, I was very angry at my father mm -hmm. for like a week. <laughs> oh, just a um, week. <laughs> yeah, just a week. Um, he dropped me off at school, and it you know it goes back to the things that you experience as as a child are very different from the things that you understand as an adult, right? Yeah. So I understand now yeah. that he um, was also entirely out of his depth, yeah, and also in a in a brand new country, in a brand new culture, in a yeah. language he didn't speak. Um, but in that moment, he was my everything, so he knew everything he knew it all yeah so he dropped me off at school and he told me don't worry they're gonna take you to a class where the um, teacher speaks Spanish and they're gonna teach you English and whatnot it's like oh okay this is much better my anxiety was lowered let my guard down um, some lady took my hand and took me off and he stayed in the you know in the front office and we get to the classroom and there's this white lady teacher I'm like, she doesn't speak Spanish. Maybe she does. Um, and then she starts talking to me in English. And I'm like, oh, no, she does not speak Spanish. Uh, so, I, you know, she probably was saying, like, welcome, what's your name? Something. Yeah. But I had no idea what, oh. she, what she was saying. Um, so I'm just staring at her blankly. And so she gets like, oh, this kid doesn't understand. Um, so in her, you know, 1990s, white, beautiful heart, um, <laughs> She starts speaking louder and slower oh, to God. me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, I still don't understand you. Where is the Spanish speaking teacher? Y'all brought me to the wrong classroom. Yeah. Um, turns out there was no Spanish speaking teacher. There's an ESL teacher that came to the school one hour a week. That's it? Yeah. So when they told him, like, we're going to take her to a class where she's going to learn English and there's going to be a Spanish speaking teacher, that's what they were referring to. Not that I would be yeah. full time in a classroom with a Spanish speaking teacher that was going to help. So I was full time in a classroom with all English speaking kids and an English speaking teacher. But do you think that helped this simulation, the learning the language quicker being kind of thrown into it? Because kids kind of younger kids learn pick up languages a little bit easier. Absolutely. Than I think At seven, yeah. it took me probably three to four months. Okay. Um, I don't think that it's helpful in the transition. I think there has to be something in between, right? Yeah. You can't go from zero to a hundred. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's how they do it now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I have, I have thoughts about how they do it now and criticisms, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, I think also they, they were also doing the best that they could yeah. with what they had. It's not like there were 20 of us. Yeah. Um, there were 20 of us in the entire school. Yeah. Um, of, of English learners, but not like 20 of us in a classroom. Okay. So... They, they were doing what they could, um, but it was rough. It was a rough 
rough start. <laughs> yeah, I can. Did you like during that time? So you said your rebellion was not speaking to your dad for like a week. Um, yeah, because he lied to me. He said I was going with a Spanish teacher, and then there's this crazy oh, lady who's that, yelling at me. So it's not about being brought over. Like, did you ever be like, "Why am I here? I want to go back home. I want to be my grandparents." No, um, I never had that. I mean, I missed my grandparents terribly, but I never had that. Like, why did you bring us here? Okay. Um, I did when I became a teenager have a lot of questions about why. Why he chose Hiram, Georgia, when <laughs> three of my aunts were in L.A. Yeah, so why Hiram, Georgia? I'm like, Georgia? come on, seriously. <laughs> if this is the choice, why would you make this one <laughs> and not L.A.? Yeah, um, that's interesting. <laughs> so my my uncle, one of my un so I had two aunts and one uncle in L.A. and then we had one uncle in Hiram, Georgia. Okay, and the uncle who had offered him a job and the place to stay was in Hiram. Hiram. So that's where we went. Okay. Um, I'm just saying, I feel like my aunts would have took, take us in to in LA. <laughs> so I'm you can saying, still go back. I could be an LA kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you could still, you know, go ask and be like, hey, can you still adopt me? I did. I went. They adopted me for like three weeks back in February. It was fantastic. <laughs> we um, went wine tasting. Oh, had the okay. That's best what time. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so you eventually then became a U.S. citizen re quite recently. recently yeah. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Is, isn't it surreal how how you came in, you know, from Colombia, this young little girl, then you went through the stages, went through school, and you eventually became a U.S. citizen. You're an immigration attorney. It's like yes. all coming like full circle, maybe your purpose, you know, this, yeah. the, what, how life brought you through it. Now you, you can relate to your clientele mm -hmm. so much better and understand it. Um, so how does it feel becoming a U.S. citizen, finally having gained that citizenship after all those years? Oh, man. Um, it is a relief, mm -hmm. a huge relief, I think, especially coming out of the Trump administration. There was, and I, during that time, I had my green card already, mm -hmm. um, but there was this incredible and innate fear that they would come for you at any time. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely felt um, a lot back to the time when I was undocumented, mm -hmm. when I just felt like in any moment they're going to deport me. I definitely felt like at any moment they're going to change the law. This crazy man is going to change the yeah. law was scary uh, surrounding green cards. Um, I also remember during that time um, there were a group of lawyers, um, and I was in law school by then. Yeah. Um, there was a group of lawyers and law students who were going down to the border to help out, and I so badly wanted to do that. Yeah. But I also read that they were putting immigration lawyers on lists, on oh, watch wow. lists, that um, translators with green cards were being stuck and not being let back in wow. through the border. So I had this very real fear of like, I'm gonna go to the border and maybe not come back. Yeah. Um, so I didn't do that. Um, so getting the citizenship felt like putting on a bulletproof vest. Okay. Felt like, you know yeah. what, now I can go where I want, when I want, how I want. Yeah. And they're not gonna take the, this one, they can't, can't take, take away. away. So I remember, I think one time we spoke, one thing that you were so looking forward to getting that citizenship was that where you can, you can go wherever you wanna go and you, were, you hadn't gone back to Colombia for mm -hmm. how many years? 20 20 years so then you yeah. just you had this vision of going back home and describe to me you mentioned something about how it wasn't what you expected yeah i think we and i think that um i've spoken to a lot of immigrants in my same situation and yes we want to live here and want to build a, a, a life here and we acknowledge that there's more opportunity here but for a lot of people the um, goal of getting a green card is so that they can return home, um, which is a little, um, it's a little odd because it, you're getting a permanent residence card, yeah. but you're getting it with the goal of going back home finally. Yeah. So you, you live your entire life here thinking like one day I'm going to have a green card and go home. Yeah. Do you do home temporarily or home like more? Home temporarily. Yeah. Um, because at least for me with assimilation, 
this never felt like home. I mean, I, okay. um, that's why I say like, I'm a Colombian ATLian. I'm yeah. not a Colombian American. Did not grow up in an American household. Yeah. Um, my mother saw kids eating peanut butter jelly sandwiches one day and she cried. Why? <laughs> The malnourishment. <laughs> How dare these American no mothers be feeding? <laughs> right. Where is the rice? Where is the beef? Where is oh the God. beans? The I mean, these poor yeah. children are being fed peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch. And she <laughs> cried. Okay. So we were living in the United States. But once you cross the threshold into my home, we were in Colombia. Yeah. We were eating Colombian food. We were speaking Spanish in the home. Um, so it was very clear that we live here, but this is not home. So you were sort of in a bubble. Were all your friends like from Colombia or were you able to simulate with America? So there was not a huge Colombian colony back then in, mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Um, it has grown yeah. ex exponentially. But at that time, um, our community was a church that we, a Hispanic church we went to. Um, and I would say it was about half Puerto Rican and half Mexican. Okay. Um, so that was the, the cultural identity that I grew up with. Um, but, but, but even then, I mean, yeah, you're going to school with an American school and then you, you're spending a lot of community time around Hispanics and at home it's Spanish and Colombian food. And, um, and so, um, there was just always a duality. Yeah. There was always a duality. There was not a lot of assimilation. My mother, um, and my father did not, um, push assimilation. Um, which I'm very grateful for. Some See, of my do you, are you grateful? Like for me, that's the same thing. Mine didn't really push for assimilation. And I remember I would be popping up my little Tupperware of like Persian stew and like green stew and all my friends would be like, what the Ew, heck is what that? what are you eating? I know, and I couldn't yes. describe it in English what it was. And so, but yeah, they didn't, but at that time was a hard, did you wish you assimilated? Now we appreciate it more as we were older. But then did you, uh, did you try fight against that you wanted to assimilate or did you kind of went with it? So I, I lived in Marietta in Cobb County for a lot of the time. And there was just a huge Hispanic community there. Yeah. So even at school, there were there were Hispanic kids that I could gravitate to. So yeah. I never felt out of place. Okay. I never felt like, oh no, like I'm not one. Also, when you get um, arroz con pollo in your, <laughs> in your, in your little box. Tupperware and you look over and the kid's saying, oh my God, what are you eating? Yeah. And they've got that disgusting Lunchable. square pizza or Lunchable. <laughs> You're like, you know what? You just don't know better. <laughs> it's your problem. I, I oh, don't I was want. trying to trade. No one would trade my ethnic food for like a bag of Doritos. Uh -uh, I just girl, wanted no. American Doritos. I, didn't want <laughs> I, I remember that feeling and coming home to my mom and like begging and begging for a Lunchable, which were severe overpriced yes finally she gets me one but not to take to school as a snack at home and I eat it I'm like this is disgusting yeah. this is what these kids are eating are you kidding me Bring, I want arroz con pollo for lunch tomorrow thank you um, so the assimilation for me wasn't a big thing I there was one year um, we moved from Marietta to Powder Springs okay and for one year I had to go to that middle school over there um, after that, I went to a magnet school that was uh, back in Smyrna. So again, I was back, back with the Mexicans. <laughs> um, but I did went, go to a predominantly white school for one year, and I did attempt to assimilate. Um, and it was rough. It was yeah. it was very clear that I had grown up differently. Twenty minutes down the road, but in a completely different culture. Yeah. Um, and also just that these were not my people. I just couldn't connect with those kids and, uh, and didn't, just didn't have an interest. Um, I tried and, uh, and then, you know, that year was over and that was done. But, but yeah, there was this always this idea that, that this isn't quite our home, we just live here. Um, and one day we'll go back home. And so, yeah, after I, I came here in 1992, and I was able to go back in 2011. So it was almost 20 years. So what was your, um, I guess, what was your feeling when you realized, okay, I can go back to Columbia? Like, what were you expecting versus the reality when you landed back there? It was, there were a lot of mixed feelings, a ton of mixed feelings, because I had my green card um, paperwork in, and it was being processed. And then my grandmother um, suffered three heart attacks in a row. Wow. Um, so she was in ICU 
and um, my green card interview wasn't for another week out. And then as you know, you don't get your actual green card for Correct. almost a month or so afterwards. And so it was this um, urgency of feeling like this green card is gonna come and she's gonna be gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I got, again, got very lucky um, and was able to go in early, um, do my interview and get the passport stamp Okay. So that I could go. So my first trip back was like an immediate trip to the ICU to see okay. my grandmother. So it was this, um, I was elated that I could go back. Yeah. But my grandmother was in ICU. So yeah. th there were all of these like things um, happening at the same time. And I was only there for about two weeks. That was the first time I went back. Wow. Then I came, came back home here to the States and um, planned another trip later on, um, a few months later where I could actually just be home. Yeah. And uh, thankfully my grandmother was fine. Good. Um, she is a tough, tough, tough old cookie. Um, but um, but yeah, the once we did go and- Did um, your mom also rush, try to rush back like once you got a green card to go back home or? Yeah, so she already had her green card. Okay. Um, so she was able to go. My sisters also went a week before okay. or a few days before I did. Um, I was the last one to make it there because I was waiting on the, yeah. on the green card. Um, yeah, but so I went back a few months later to really visit and um, I found out that I don't know very much about the actual culture. Wow. Um, I don't speak, I mean, we speak the same language, but I don't, that's not a dialect that I speak. Those are not there are cultural terms that I don't know, that I don't understand. I didn't grow up there. True. Um, there are a lot of things, even now, even, you know, I, I've gone back a ton of times now. I go back really, I try to go back at least once a year, sometimes twice. Um, but even now when I meet um, Colombians who just immigrated and they start asking a lot of questions um, and trying to connect, I'm like, yo, I'm not really from there like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's one question about that a lot of Colombian, which seems really, really innocuous, which is like, oh, well, what part of Colombia are you from, from Bogota? Okay, well, what part of Bogota are you from? Yeah. Um, which I don't think a lot of other people ask. Like if you tell somebody like, oh, I'm from Atlanta, they're not like, oh, well, what part of Atlanta? Yeah. Um, different neighborhoods, some places yeah. have different neighbors, kind but of it matters. reputation with different neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. it matters. There's, um, well, there's a lot of classism in Colombia. Yeah. So the neighborhood that you're from matters. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I was seven. I don't remember. I don't remember the street or the neighborhood name or whatever. And, and honestly, even if I didn't, none of us live there anymore. They sold that house years and years and years ago. Yeah. Um, and so things like that where I just, I don't connect. And people are like, oh, well, what part are you from the north? Are you from the south? Are you from the... I'm like, I don't, I don't know where I am now. I, <laughs> I'm just here. <laughs> Would you still call Columbia home? Oh, um, that's a good question. I think uh, maybe my spiritual home, but not... I wouldn't call I like it that. my cultural home I like that anymore. spiritual home, yeah. Yeah, I think um, my spirit is there, um, and I'll always go back. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't feel like I will ever go back to live there on a permanent basis. Um, I don't like, you can't like, merge back into that. No, you can't, you can't merge back. And, um, and I don't want to, um, I, I grew up here. I grew up here in Atlanta. You okay. know, I, I need grits. <laughs> yeah. So if you can't, so Columbia is not home, but then. So is Atlanta home? Like, or do you feel like you're just, because it, it is a tricky situation, especially for a lot, and this is like an advice I would love for you to give to young um, arrivals, especially kids who didn't have a choice to come when they're young, that, and they had no choice coming here, um, that like, they, you feel probably, it sounds like you feel kind of lost in the middle. You, it's yeah. like, like a, it's like you're a spirit between two. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know if you ever watched the movie Selena. Sel I think it was a while. Selena's back. dad. They're they're riding in the in the bus and they're gonna go um, perform in Mexico, and he's trying to impart to Selena um, the cultural differences, right? And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like we're Mexican. It's 
we're going we're Mexican and we're going to Mexico. It's not yeah. a problem. Um, and he's like, no, it's it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> so he says to Selena, uh, we're never going to be Mexican enough for the Mexicans, and we're never going to be American enough for the Americans. Oh, amen. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's what I feel. Right. I'm never going to be Colombian enough to feel completely comfortable in Colombia. Yeah. I'm definitely not American enough to feel at home here. Um, and I think that is what it sounds sad. Yeah. Um, it's also just part, part and parcel to being um, bicultural, binational, bilingual. Yeah. By everything. That just that's what it means. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's more fluid now. Life it like cultures and borders everything's much more fluid it's getting harder and harder to kind of yeah box in. exactly so i think it's um i think it's a privilege that i get to experience both that yeah. i get to love both I love um that. but yeah i don't it also means that you're in a sense homeless right yeah. you don't have that you don't have that home um I, you know i'm never gonna walk into a store and feel completely comfortable if there's a white clerk behind the mm -hmm. counter because they're going to be looking at me differently. That's part of living in the U.S. But also, when I'm in Colombia, um, I'm not riding public transportation by myself. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel. I didn't grow up in that culture, and I don't feel safe um, completely. Yeah. Um. So. It, it, and it is what it is. I mean, you, you get you get to have so many wonderful and great things. And nobody ever sent me to school with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in my backpack. Thank goodness. Um, but um, but it also just means that we also have to take that that um, disappointment sometimes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing the insight. I know it's a, it's a lot to kind of divulge and kind of go back to that moment. Yeah. You know, you've come so far, but I think really it helps a lot of people. And that's why I try to do with these podcasts, these messages, is to let there's so much unspoken truth out there that I think mm -hmm. people are hesitant to talk about and don't realize yeah. so many are going through it and feel that. And just to get that sense of home in the sense that you're not alone. There are others yeah. that are going through it and to maybe reach out to one another and how, how did you process this? Kind of sort of like a group. Group therapy. Group therapy, group yes. counseling, you know? Your little groupie to get through these moments. Yeah. Because it is hard. It, things are hard. And that would be my advice is find community. Yeah. Um, that's what's gotten me through it. I went through that experience going back home, going back to Columbia and realizing that is not home. Um, realizing that, you know, even when I'm speaking with my family, I will forget words in Spanish sometimes and just get stuck in the middle of the conversation. Um, and, and that was incredibly disheartening in the moment. Yeah. Um, but I got invited into a group chat for formerly undocumented people. Wow. And um, there was about uh, 20, 30 people in the group. Come to find out, we all had felt, felt exactly the same. We all got yeah. our green card and had survivor's guilt. We all tried to go home oh, and, wow. realize, and, and felt out of place. Um, and so one of the things that I learned through that process and through being undocumented and not talking about it, because growing up, it was the one thing, the one rule you had in life is never tell anybody, yeah. um, is learning that all of our burdens are easier when we share them with yes. community and that you're never alone. Uh, you know, I think we. Grew I think up it's easier for this generation now. Our parents, you know, because to talk about or complain about, you know, everything was secretive. Yes. Or even to feel that you're struggling is like because I'm sure they got a lot from back home. It's like, well, you escaped. You were able to get out. So yes. what are you complaining about? Yeah. But they don't realize, you know, it's a double-edged sword. It's not all glorious. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this generation. That's what I hope we all do is start talking about it more and help each other out through this because it really, you know, you need a village when you go through these different faces Absolutely. of life. Absolutely. I think the secrecy and the silence creates isolation. Yes. Um, it also just... Or shame. Isolation is shame, Shame. The shame that comes from thinking that you're the only one that this is going yeah. through. And um, however it may sound, guess what? You're not special. <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds, yeah. if not thousands, if not millions of people that are probably going through the same experience as you. Yeah. And um, sometimes it feels great to find out that you're not special, that you're not unique. Yeah. And there are other people that went through it. It's normal to feel the, feel, the what you're doing. Like you say that, survivorship guilt. It's normal to feel that. You yeah. Know? You're not the only one. Yeah, it helps yeah. a lot to a relieve ton. that 
responsibility than yeah, shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. So finding community has been incredibly helpful for me, realizing that there is a whole group of formerly undocumented people that are out there um, that you can talk to, um, chat with, and get, get support from. That helps. That helps a lot. That's awesome. I'm so happy you found that. And Thank you. So happy that we had this chat. Thank you so much Me for coming. Too. It was such a joy. Definitely going to have to have more to pick with you <laughs> later on in future episodes. Thank you for inviting me. Anytime. This is fantastic.